today and get your full in-depth review of the new DJI Air 3, including 19 new things to know on what has changed between the DJI Air 3 and its predecessor, the Air 2S. Now, as usual, this video is definitely not sponsored. I'm gonna tell you the good, bad, and the ugly on this aircraft. And with that, let's just dive right into it with number one, which is the price. The price has increased slightly from $999 up to $1,099, including the base remote. There are two remote options, which I'll talk about in just a second. There's the base remote, and then there's the DJI RC2, which is just like the DJI RC, except with the number two at the end of it. You can see the rest of the pricing right there. The core thing to know though is that the fly combo kit includes three total batteries. So there's one in the aircraft as well as two more here, plus this charging hub, some extra props, as well as one of the two remote controllers. There is not, however, at this point in time, the ability to buy just the aircraft itself, nor to buy just the aircraft in the DJI RC, the one that has a built-in screen. Uh, so if you wanna get the RC, buy the whole bundle because it's only 80 bucks more and you get two extra batteries and the extra props and and the, there's a bag inside like it's just kind of an obvious choice okay so with the money stuff out of the way let's talk about the cool stuff the tech uh, and by far the biggest new feature on this unit here is the additional second lens or second camera system that you see right there which is the telephoto lens uh, it is a three by telephoto lens effectively giving you an equivalent focal length of 70 millimeters whereas the main camera lens gives you an equivalent focal length of 24 millimeters and the obvious idea here being that you have a full zoom lens on the unit itself just like you would have seen with the uh, Mavic 3 series, for example, and the Mavic 3 Pro, uh, and even some past DJI cameras. And without question, this is my favorite feature on this camera. However, it actually ties into other favorite features later on because it gives you more flexibility for things like ActiveTrack, which is supported on the tele lens uh, that we'll talk about. Now, despite adding that new lens, we actually get a significant camera spec bump on the main lens. So it goes from what used to be an f2.8 down to an f1.7. That basically gives you better low light performance. Uh, and then on the secondary camera lens, that zoom lens, uh, we have an f2.8. And then with that, we go from what used to be a one inch sensor on the main camera in the past to a one over one third inch sensor. Now in the past, some people have been hesitant to use a zoom lens on some of the DJI products, uh, thinking it has like lesser quality or something like that. And in some cases that was true in the past, it had like lesser functionality uh, and it had usually a lower, you know, F value. But in terms of like image quality and that kind of stuff, this is spot on. Here's a bunch of footage you're looking at right now on that zoom lens. It looks spectacular. Uh, and the main benefit of the zoom lens is the fact that you can be further away from your subject. And that's useful from a safety standpoint, but even from like a shot standpoint, you get a bit of a blurrier background look to it. You can get better parallax in shots. Overall, there are way more benefits to having a zoom lens than just simply cropping in. However, that does get to number three on the list, which is the reduction of the resolution of the main camera. So in the Air 2S, the main camera was 5.4K. However, now the main camera is 4K. There's no two ways about it. Let's call a spade a spade here. That is a reduction of resolution. And DJI will talk about all sorts of amazing stuff, how the overall image quality is better in. That may be the case, but at the end of the day, you've massively reduced the resolution of the main camera. Now on the flip side though, most people use that additional resolution to crop in. So you had this bigger image and you crop in to like effectively zoom to something. Now you can do that natively optically with the 4K uh, sensor on the zoom lens. So the tele lens. So for most people, this is a better scenario than the past. But if you were shooting and wanted to have, you know, 5.4K uh, for video at the main camera, then yeah, it's a downgrade. But if we're talking photos, then hold on to your horses because that is a whole different ball game we'll get to in just a second. Additionally, as you've seen throughout this video, you get a huge boost in the slow-mo options. 4K is now at 100 frames per second versus 60 in the past, and 1080p goes up to 200 frames per second versus 120 in the past. I would say though, this does seem like a play to basically try to keep the Mavic 3 Pro sales where they are and not completely cannibalize that product. Uh, though that product has the three lenses as opposed to two lenses, which I think is awesome, but I can see how if the resolutions were the same there for the vast majority of people, you're gonna save yourself like almost a thousand bucks and go with this instead. Now, next up on the list is something that is super exciting, but not like super cool to show, uh, which is the simple fact that virtually everything on both of these lenses is equal. Uh, so for example, you can do 10-bit on both lenses. You can do D-log on both lenses. You can go ahead and do active track on both lenses and virtually every single photo and video mode on both lenses. If you've been around the DJI block long enough, you know that there's always been like catches to the second lenses. There's no catches here. It just they're equal across the board with the exception of the f-stop being f.1.7 and f2.8. Otherwise, 
they're the equal. Everything works the same way. Now, with that exciting bit of news, one quick note. If you can whack that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe, it really does help with the channel quite a bit. I've got a ton of new videos on this dropping over the next couple of days, each sequential day, with all sorts of crazy new things I've done with it. So just be on the lookout for that. Now, the next bit of news here is the new RC. Uh, technically, two new RCs. So you've got the DJI RC2, which is this one here, uh, basically the successor to the DJI RC. The most obvious change is the antennas that you see right there. They flip up uh, and they store when they're not in use. That increases the range we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, you'll see they removed one of the USB-C ports. There was never use for anyways. Micro SD card is still there. Uh, on the back, they changed the vent location and also the little screws. So if you had a mount or something like that, uh, it is not compatible anymore if you use those top screws. The bottom screws are the same, however. Uh, and the idea here is that this is your standalone controller. So if you have the DJI RC N2, which is a non-screen version of this, then you take your phone, you stick it in, and you can go ahead and use that to control the drone. Up until now, I've largely recommended using the DJI RC for the various drones that have released over the last couple of years or last year, anyways, with the Mini 3, for example, and the Mavic 3 Pro, uh, because it just the just works factor is super high. You don't have to deal with messing your phone or even tie your phone up. And that's mostly true here as well, uh, except one really big bummer. This aircraft is not at all compatible with the DJI RC1. Inversely, the DJI RC2 is not compatible with any other aircraft DJI makes today. So a year ago, this thing came out, like literally just a year ago it came out and it's already dumpster fire dead. And that's, like, come on, that, there's no excuse for that. The whole point of these standalone controllers was that you would be able to go ahead and add more and more aircraft over time. I could add a Mini 3 when I want to fly that, add the Mavic 3 Pro when I want to fly that, and just take one controller and have one controller and reduced waste with like buying all these stupid bundles I don't need to buy. That's already out the window. And so while I still firmly believe this is the better controller for the system, uh, we'll talk about range in just a second, I am super bummed that DJI didn't introduce backwards compatibility either into this or to this. I would have been okay-ish if the Air 3 came out and it was only compatible with this controller, but this was still backwards compatible with all the other aircraft. I would have, I would have been fine with that. Uh, but to have it like be this complete, it's just, it's not very good. However, what is significantly better is the range increases. Uh, and that's because of the addition of DJI's O4, basically the transmission standards of sorts. Uh, and so O4 gives them a whole bunch better range, at least on spec, but also far more importantly in real life. If you've watched my reviews in the past with this controller here, especially if you're in Europe, uh, you would have seen that there's been lots of challenges with reception on the older controller. I have had zero problems with reception on the newer controller, uh, and I'm certainly not gonna be able to hit 10 kilometers of range because that's way beyond legal compliance here, but I've been well over double the range I was ever able, able to get on this here. Uh, the, usually I would top out like 900 meters, 1,000 meters on this in European mode. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar, Basically, uh, there are two core modes anyways to DJI's products. Uh, there's FCC mode for North America, Canada, and a bunch of other countries. And there's CE mode for Europe and also a bunch of other countries. Which country you fall under, it's a whole different thing for a whole different day. Uh, but at the end of the day, it basically changes the power and transmission power of this dynamically to go ahead and be within legal compliance. So that meant if I was flying this aircraft here in Europe, uh, I would have lesser range than if I flew it in America. Uh, and it changes dynamically again based on where you are. Uh, next up on the list is the biggie in terms of flight time. They've increased the flight time from a claimed 31 minutes to a claimed 46 minutes. Maybe? Uh, you know, the closest I've got is just over about 30 minutes of actual flight time, uh, but it is heavier winds. I live in the Netherlands. It's windy every single day. So I am reducing the battery power when I'm flying in winds like that. Uh, and then equally, the other time they didn't have winds, I was up in the mountains at 8,000 feet. So that also reduces the battery time. Uh, keep in mind though, that 46 minutes isn't really with recording of video. Uh, it's mostly just flying around and potentially taking photos. If you're recording video, that actually reduces, as you might expect, uh, the battery time quite a bit faster, in fact. Uh, but nonetheless, I would say my actual spec time here uh, is just about 30 minutes or so. Next, a biggie for people like myself that are into sports and active track, uh, or just beginners for that matter, is they now have full omnidirectional obstacle avoidance. Uh, so in the past, you had obstacle avoidance front and rear and up and down on the Air 2S, but you do not have side to side obstacle avoidance, meaning that you could take your, your drone and just plow it into something like this from the side. Uh, what they've done here though, is they've changed the obstacle avoidance sensors. These are the sensors right there. One, two, one right there down the corner, three, 
and four, uh, plus the ones on the bottom. And they've made them so they're tilted off the edges like this. You can see it's kind of um, on the edge there. And so it has this full vision, uh, basically making a bubble around it, and it will avoid crashing into things. Thus far, I've not crashed into anything yet, which, if you know me, is a pretty good thing, because I push these things pretty hard uh, from an action track standpoint. Next, they've added all focus track support, which means all like the spotlight modes and POI modes and action track modes to both lenses. Uh, I want to call this out as a, like a definitive line item, because again, that was not the case, as well as at full 4K60, uh, which you couldn't do in the past either, you limited to 4K30. Uh, that's super notable, because you can now do actor track on the tele lens from far away, which is huge from like a safety standpoint. You can be further away from the object you're tracking, potentially be out of the trees or above the trees or whatever the case is, uh, and have a better chance of this thing surviving. Uh, while I did just talk about obstacle avoidance, when you get into the winter months with lower light and in branches without leaves on them, in those cases, that, that's where this obstacle avoidance tends to, to struggle a bit. Right now, it's super green out, so it's pretty easy for this to not hit anything. Next, they've added ActorTrack 5.0. Uh, now, there's a bunch of things that come with ActorTrack 5.0. Uh, the biggest one is better object recognition and tracking, so when it loses something behind a tree, for example, it can resume and find it faster. Uh, that's improved the last couple of years with other drones. Uh, but one of the more interesting things from a tracking standpoint is the ability to choose exactly which tracking angle to track from. So where do you want the drone to be in relation to you. Uh, and you can see this on the bottom there of the screen, basically the options you can choose from. Choose the one you want, and it'll stay there the entire time. I've got a whole separate video on active track, uh, but in short, thus far, so good. I haven't crashed it. It's followed me exactly where I wanted to. I've done tracking about cycling, as well as like following random people, also following motorboats and yachts and all sorts of things like that, uh, and have had no problems at all. Next, they've added waypoint support. Uh, so this allows you to create pre-planned routes in the controller. Uh, well, you actually just have to fly the route, but once you fly it, you can fly it over and over again. Uh, the exact same camera movements and altitudes, and you can change all the settings you want to change, and you can save that and so you can basically do that not just within the same flight repeatedly uh, and you can change the speed so once you've planned it at a slower speed you can ramp it up and do a much faster uh, run through with a whole bunch of different waypoints but you can fly day after day or month after month or even year after year for example uh, charting the progress of a construction site or the land or whatever the case may be that's something we saw added to the Mavic 3 back a few months ago uh, and now it is here on the Air 3 as well next they've increased the range of the gimbal now, there are two range specifications here. There's the mechanical range, which is really useful when it comes to gusts of wind and things like that. That's been increased. And there's the controllable range. That's the range that you can control to. Uh, so the gimbal basically is a piece right here. Let me just show you there. By the way, you can touch it just fine as long as it's not powered on. But if it's powered on, then don't touch it. Uh, and so this is flat right here. It's pointing straight out. Uh, and they used to be in the past. This is the highest that the Air 2S can go. But now with the Air 3, you can go up 60 degrees controllable like that. That's cool if you're like following a tree or skyscraper. You can start like this and slowly kind of change and go like that over the top of it. Something they've introduced in some of the other recent drones as well, uh, and that's helpful there. It still has the same 90 degrees straight down uh, maximum, you know, controllable range there, but this gives you a little more flexibility on that. It's one of those things that sounds silly listening to it until you accidentally use it. You will accidentally use it at some point and be like, oh, I just went beyond, you know, like horizontal plane and it worked out just great. Now, with that said, they've also added a vertical shooting mode, but not in the way you probably want. On the Mini 3 Pro, the entire gimbal can rotate 90 degrees uh, and basically allows it vertical shooting, so you have native vertical video support for everything, and photo support as well. Uh, here, though, it doesn't rotate 90 degrees. Instead, there is a vertical crop that just simply takes down the middle of your image, uh, and it just, I mean, it's a crop, right? A maximum video of 2.7K, uh, but you can at least do all that shooting natively if you want to, uh, as opposed to doing it in post. You can do that. I mean, honestly, you're, it's the same video. Just shoot it wide and then eventually crop exactly what you want. It gives you more flexibility. But I understand some people want that, and that is there. Don't worry, though. We'll go back to good news starting right now, which is a vast increase in the megapixels for photo, going from 20 megapixels up to 48 megapixels. Uh, and that also includes a huge jump up in the panoramic photo side as well, uh, going from 8,000, well, there's, here's the numbers on the screen right there. It's a huge, huge jump. And of course, again, those photo sizes are true on both cameras. Uh, so you can do photos, you can't do panoramas on both cameras because it just does it all for you on the main camera, uh, which is good because it has better image quality, of course, or sorry, better uh, low light quality. Uh, but in the case of all the photos, you can do that across all modes, RAW and JPEG uh, on both cameras as you see fit. But of course, where there's good, there's also bad. Uh, in this case, it's the removal of the 8K 
hyperlapse option that was on the Air 2S. That allowed you to create hyperlapses and have that export out in 8K video. Now, almost no one actually ever did that export of 8K video to anything else, but you could do it and that's what mattered. Uh, and that's now gone. Instead, you have a 4K option there. Next, we've got three little nice spec bumps here. Number one, they slightly increase the speeds from 19 meters a second to 21 meters a second, are basically 75.6 kilometers an hour. They've also increased the wind, the official wind resistance spec, which is a whole different thing for a whole different video. And that's gone from basically 10.5 to 12 uh, meters a second. Again, I have a whole separate video on that. It went out yesterday. It's still alive. I was uh, well above that spec. Uh, and again, it's still here. Next, I've sped up the charging times. If you have a USB-C 90 watt charger, which is what you probably have with your laptop, uh, you can charge this thing in an hour, one hour per battery. You can always use the battery hub that comes with a combo dish, combo pack, uh, and you plug it on the side there. It does not charge it concurrently. It does one battery at a time, uh, but essentially you can just you know, pack them there and three hours later and you've got all three, assuming they were empty, uh, obviously they were less than empty, then you'll charge them faster than that. And then last but not least, a boring spec thing. The weight has increased here um, from 595 grams to 720 grams. Don't think that really matters for most people. Uh, you know, in some cases, weight matters if you're trying to stay under the 250 gram limit or things like that. But this was already in no man's land from a regulatory standpoint. So it's not really gonna matter for, for most scenarios. Anyways, there you go, a complete review and look at the Air 3, uh, a very solid option. Uh, I think it's also a safe option. It's one of those ones that didn't undercut the Mavic 3 or Mavic 3 Pro in particular at the higher end, uh, but gives things a very solid spec boost in almost every category, uh, especially like practical spec boost. I know the resolution is a drop, but I will happily take uh, omnidirectional obstacle avoidance and the tele lens over 5.4K any day of the week, no problem there. And I will also happily take that all the features are available on both lenses. I just got really tired with scenarios in the past where it was only like the main lens and not the secondary lens. So the fact that that's solved across the board makes this like really, really solid for what is a very small increase in price compared to all the other price increases that we've seen over the last few years. Anyways, again, if you found this video interesting and useful, go ahead and whack that like button at the bottom there. Or hit subscribe for plenty more Air 3 goodness. I've got a complete beginner's guide. I've got a uh, complete active track like test case follow me. I've got my wind test. And I've got a complete deep dive into this controller. All the questions that you ever wanted to know. That's it. Have a good one.